Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being with us at Marquette University Law School. My name is Joseph Kearney, and it's a great privilege for me as Dean of the Law School to welcome you to our Lubar Center. As many of you know, the Lubar Center is many things, but two in particular. It is this splendid room in Eckstein Hall, the law school's home since 2010. It is also a shorthand for our substantive initiative, the Lubar Center for Public Policy Research and Civic Education. We established the center in 2017 to honor the vision and generosity of Shell and Marianne Lubar, wonderful benefactors of Marquette Law School and of a good deal else in this city and state. Of course, we were a going concern even then. I don't refer so much to this law school, which has been part of this city since the late 19th century, as I do to what pre-Lubar Center we used to call our public policy initiative. This is a name that we began to develop sometime after Mike Gouche joined us in 2007 as senior fellow in law and public policy and began to carve out an identity for us in terms of direct engagement even beyond that of legal academics in public policy topics. If two points determine a line or at any rate require a name, then Alan Borsuk's arrival here in 2009 occasioned our use of public policy initiative. Subsequently, Charles Franklin joined us in 2012, launching the Mark Hill Law School poll. Dave Striffling began our water law and policy initiative in 2015, and John Johnson arrived in 2016 with a particular portfolio for research. More recently still, Hillary DuBois, whom you have met already this afternoon in greeting you, became Lubar Center Manager of our programs in 2020, succeeding Rita Alamon. That brings me almost to today, to Derek Mosley. Anyway, Mike Goucher remains with us as Senior Advisor in Law and Public Policy, but he has stepped back from daily duties. As his successor of sorts and as our inaugural director of the Lubar Center, a title that we had not used before, we recruited back to Marquette Law School, Judge Derek Mosley of our class of 1995. He had an advantage over others whom we considered. By this, I do not mean only that he, like me, hails from the south side of Chicago, but nonetheless has <laughs> embraced Milwaukee. Rather, the crucial advantage is that we went out and recruited him. I'm not suggesting that Judge Mosley was a hard sell. He shares our view that Milwaukee needs economic, cultural, and social drivers, and that this law school with its Lubar Center is especially well situated to play a constructive role in all of this. So we had a handoff of sorts earlier this month when we had both Mike Couche and Derek Mosley here on the issues in the Lubar Center. For those of you who were not here, you may want to watch it online where you can find it, as with just about all of our Lubar Center programming. We haven't seen the last of Mike at the law school, but this is Derek's first on the issues to host, and it is especially apt. New leadership, new Milwaukee. We welcome four most important government leaders of our city and county. It will be Derek's privilege to introduce them, but I want to welcome them and thank them sincerely for their interest in being here and to do the same with all of you. Without more, I yield to Derek Mosley, director of the Lubar Center. Thank you. All right, let's do this. All right, good afternoon. How's everybody? Good, glad to hear it. Welcome to my first On the Issues. I'm really excited, and when I had to pick what I wanted to do for On the Issues, I had to go back and, and go back home, if you will. Um, I, so Jose and I are the same age, but I remember these three, I remember these three when they were in high school. And so um, it's good to have them here, and I'm proud of them immensely. Um, but we've titled this uh, New Leadership, New Milwaukee. And the reason why we did that is for the first time in 177 years in the city of Milwaukee, and the first time in 188 years in the county of Milwaukee, 
The people in leadership are all people of color. So yeah. give me a round of applause for that. Congratulations. <laughs> so I will begin by introducing um, the first ever African American who was elected Milwaukee County Executive, Mr. David Crowley. Next, I'd like to introduce the first African-American and Latina woman to ever be Milwaukee County Board Chairwoman, Boricua. Marcelia Nicholson. Boricua. <laughs> <laughs> to her left is uh, the first African-American to be elected mayor in the city of Milwaukee, Cavalier Johnson. And you got the two old folks book, book, <laughs> book in this. Speak for yourself. I'm like, <laughs> I'd like to introduce to you the first elected Latino, the Common Council President, Jose Perez. Whip up. All right, so we're going to get into it, but I just want to start with a little background information. And all of you grew up in the city of Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. So I just want to start with you, David. I'm going to ask you, you tell me, what was your experience growing up in the city of Milwaukee? Oh, wow. Well, great question. So my experience growing up in the city of Milwaukee is the tale of two cities. Yes. I grew up on 23rd and Burleigh. Uh, my father was a, uh, was a master electrician. My mother was a Jane of all trades. Uh, but they also suffered from drug addiction. But we also had family members uh, that suffered from mental health issues as well. Um, and I talk about the tale of, of two counties particularly because uh, I lived on 23rd and Burleigh and seen the haves as well as the have-nots. Yeah. And so when you think about, you know, going to uh, Milwaukee Public Schools my whole life, uh, being a part of this community and working in this community my entire adult life, uh, we, didn't very, we, didn't, we really didn't have much. And so it was an opportunity for us uh, as a family to really get out here. And I took advantage of that by being involved in organizations like Urban Underground that truly saved my life and put me on this path. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. So. I, know. I always <laughs> got to stay close to this one. This one I got to stay close to. Marcelia, the same question. I just want to ask you, what do you remember growing up in Milwaukee? Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Judge Mosley, for Thanks. having us. Um, thank you all, Marquette community, for being here with us. Yes. Um, so like David, um, I didn't grow up too far from him. I was on 12th and Burleigh. Um, and very similarly, um, I didn't have a, the, the most ideal upbringing. Um, I remember learning having to go under the bed when we heard gunshots at night. Um, you know, I saw all sorts of things that no child should ever see. Um, and my parents had to work a lot. My dad um, didn't have a formal education. He hadn't graduated high school. He went back later in life. My mom, Puerto Rican, her first language was Spanish. Um, but they did instill in me a, the, you know, the power of education. So when I was hiding under that bed, I was reading books. Um, <laughs> and it was the teachers in the Milwaukee public school system that nurtured me and, and kept me you know, um, out of recess because I was sometimes scared to go outside that trauma you carry with you. Um, and it was when I kind of became an adult and became a teacher and I saw that those children were dealing with the same things I was dealing with, I knew I had to get even more involved. So I'm um, really happy to be here while, you know, the, the, the childhood was not ideal. Um, you know, having these two and actually this entire row of folks, um, you know, supporting you and backing you up and helping you create a newer vision for um, how our children can grow up and how better, that's really what this is all about. So again, thank you for that question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor Johnson. Uh, uh, thank you, Judge, Director, uh, Derek. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Hootie, Hootie, Hootie. <laughs> Wedding officiant, uh, just goes on Influencer. and on. Uh, yeah, all those things. Today's um, my day. Right. Oh, today, Today's by the way, I proclaimed it to be Derek Mosley Day throughout the entire city of Milwaukee. <laughs> That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you know, Growing up in Milwaukee, the, the, the county executive, the county board chairwoman, and I, we share this experience because all three of us uh, spent some time at least growing up in the 53206 zip code. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, it's one of the most incarcerated zip codes uh, in the United States for African-American men. By the time uh, young black men reach you know, my age of 36, half of us would have spent some time behind bars. And believe you me, I got uh, the, the, the friends, the relatives to prove it. Um, but you have those challenges growing up, and we certainly did, whether it's food insecurity, housing insecurity. I moved around so many different times, went to six different 
elementary schools uh, within Milwaukee Public Schools before finally being able to settle into one school. Um, but even with those challenges, you still had you know, some stabilizing forces in your neighborhood, right? You had parents who cared about you who, even though they had issues of their own, they're trying to make sure that you go on the best path forward in your life. Uh, organizations, County Exec talked about Urban Underground for him. For me, it was the, the YMCA, and I wear this YMCA wristband every day because that's how I got my start in, in service. So a lot of challenges, yes, certainly, uh, but there's a lot of promise uh, in this city uh, and the organizations as well. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> President Perez. Uh, thank you. For me, I mean, I grew up on Fifth and Pierce, and in those days, uh, it was a very highly commercial area for Latinos. Uh, there were many businesses in the, in the neighborhood. It was where everyone came and settled in and moved south and west. And uh, my grandparents spent a lot of time raising me. So our house was one of those homes where everyone came from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And that was a place to stay before they moved on to get a job. And even though the neighborhood was kind of rough, we knew how to maneuver through it. There were pockets you could go to, not go to. And um, I always say that uh, the Felix Montilla Little League days that I played were my wonder years that I, I go back and reflect on how wonderful it was to, to be a part of something that uh, really brought together a lot of kids in the neighborhood and we did so many positive things. And it was segregated. I mean, we were always told not to cross the viaduct, so we crossed the viaduct, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we did. And I'll never forget that we used to cross the viaduct to go to 6th in Wisconsin. There used to be a movie theater there because you could get uh, you could see three kung fu movies for like four bucks. <laughs> and, and they're all day. And by the time we got home, we were hungry because we didn't have any money to buy popcorn. Or anything. Oh. <laughs> but um, it, it was what we did. And uh, even though it was rough, we, we figured out a way through family and the community to, to stay alive. And so I hear the same theme. We talked about the same theme, whether it was safety, whether it was food insecurity, uh, whether it was hiding under the bed. And so I, I heard about uh, Felix Mantilla's uh, baseball league. We've heard about the why. And, Sponsor Scholar, you mentioned Urban Underground, mm -hmm. and um, Marcelia, you mentioned the <laughs> teachers Teacher. at MPS who circled you and, and, and helped you. Definitely. And the reason why I wanted to bring out your stories up front is because I know there's a number of youth in our community who have gone through the same types of issues that we talk about, mm -hmm. but it's important that they see all of you and understand that despite that fact, it's still possible that you can to make a difference. So. Uh, my next question for everybody on the panel, and I'll start down with President Perez and we'll come back down this way. Um, what did you do prior to running for office? Um, I did several jobs that I remember. Uh, I got elected in 2012, and um, it had to be 20 years before that that I decided I wanted to run for office. And when I did that, it was because we were sitting in a neighborhood meeting, working an alder around uh, being tougher on landlords because people in our church were just living in vile conditions. And I said to myself, I want to be on, on the other side of that table. I need someone from the neighborhood to be on the other side of that table. And when I decided that, I said, now I'm going to start my path, my journey, that I'm going to, you know, grow professionally and personally develop so I can be as ready as I can by the time I decide to run, that it's it. I, I, can, I can't do any more preparation. So I was working with young people. I did uh, gang prevention and um, youth, uh, gang intervention and youth intervention programs. I worked with the late, great Ron Johnson, who was one of my mentors doing that. I did community organizing, which really changed my life. And um, that, for me, any true community organizing entity will focus on relationships. And if they're not focusing on relationships, they're not good organizers. So. For me, relationships are everything, and it taught me how to build them. It isn't an exchange of business cards. It's having some real tough conversations, hearing some very deep stories, not changing the subject when people talk about pain and suffering, having the courage to, to listen, listen through that. And those relationships, I think, are what drive any success. So for me, it was community organizing, uh, which was, was at the root of everything I did. And then I ended up working at the city. And I did that through MICA, by the way. I should give them credit, because they had some awesome leadership training and um, worked at the city doing uh, economic development or commercial corridors. That opened my eyes. Then left to, do, to start my own business at the height of the real estate crash, so I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned a lot, and then from there I decided to run for office and took out a, you know, an incumbent that hadn't happened in over a decade. Mm -hmm. So everything was about how was it I prepare myself. And I went to school, I, I didn't have a college education, and I went to 
Cardinal Stretch with a GED and was their first political science graduate. Nice. All right. Nice. Mayor, uh, what did, did you do prior to uh, political office? Prior to political office, uh, I worked in workforce development. So there was a, uh, or is, uh, an organization in town. Uh, today it's called Employ Milwaukee. Uh, I started there as an intern um, in college at UW-Madison. Um, and I developed a relationship where when I was in town, when I was in Milwaukee and not overseas studying abroad or in Europe or in South America or in New York or other places uh, doing service work, uh, I'd be there uh, and I'd be working in workforce development. So um, when I was there, we worked uh, with the Earn and Learn Summer Youth Jobs Program that I was a participant in. I believe that uh, all of us were yeah. participants in and our siblings and the like. Um, so I had the opportunity to be one of the administrators in the program, supervising kids, connecting young people in Milwaukee with their first summer job opportunity. Also staffed our resource room there, so helping seniors in our community to retool their resumes to get back into the workforce. So helping folks in uh, for their first job and helping folks in for potentially their last job uh, in the workforce as well. Uh, some of those responsibilities also included working with young people uh, who unfortunately uh, were uh, uh, inmates at Lincoln Hills. Uh, and so I've, I've taken trips uh, up to Lincoln Hills and seen the conditions there and worked directly with young people who've been affected uh, by you know, the institution and having to travel that far and their families, quite frankly, too, who uh, had, to, had to travel that far. So uh, a lot of work in the workforce development uh, sphere before eventually uh, running for office and getting elected. Alderman, then council president, then, of course, mayor. Full circle on the earn and learn, right? So you went from <laughs> working for earn and learn to actually being the head of earn and learn as the mayor. Now I'm calling people to ask for money to raise money for them. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Marcelia. Yeah, my, my work history runs the gamut. I started young. Um, <laughs> Is it true that, I, mean, I heard, so bless you. Bless you. I, I, I heard somewhere that you were a fourth grade teacher. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So um, uh, my, my very first job was McDonald's. I was there four years. and. Uh, Y'all been to McDonald's and you've seen, the, you've seen the horror stories, but I'll tell you this, my customer service is on point today with my constituents <laughs> because of that experience. Um, but yeah, I, I did sort of everything you can do to earn money so I can help my parents pay bills. I eventually moved out on my own at, at 17 and a half, started paying my own bills. Um, I wanted to invest in myself, so I went to school. I was the first in my family to go to college at a guidance counselor that paid my fees and everything. I got in um, and I decided to become a teacher because they all invested in me. I wanted to give that same opportunity back to um, children like me that grew up in my neighborhood. Um, when I got to the classroom, oh, I was so disillusioned. I thought I was gonna save the world, right? One child at a time. They handed me a class roster of 34 children. Um, they assigned me a classroom and had two tables, like five chairs. Two of them were broken upside down, and they're like, create this environment conducive to learning. I ain't gotten my first paycheck, you know? <laughs> None of that. And so I actually reached out to my local teachers union, and I told them, I need supplies. I need books, chairs, tables. Um, and through them, I helped organize a supply drive for the entire school. Um, I then became a, a member of that union. I started organizing with that union. So while teaching, I was a community organizer. Um, I started getting involved with politics only because, and I didn't grow up in a, a voting family, I got involved in politics because I started asking questions. Who are these people with the clipboards coming in my classroom, you know, telling me what should be going on when they didn't see that I just brought in breakfast for my entire class, when we had to stop and have a prayer circle because one of them had just lost a parent, whether it was to incarceration or homicide or whatever have you. And so we're, we're, we're dealing with these complex challenges in the classroom, and we have people at the top making decisions who never stepped foot in the classroom. So uh, once I got out there and vocal about that particular issue, I actually got recruited to run for office. I never woke up and thought that I was qualified enough to do it. Um, no one like me, no one I knew, no one I ever grew up with had accomplished something like that. Um, but it was the teachers, it was my students knocking doors with me, um, you know, calling up their neighbors, um, parents donating to me, teachers volunteering on my campaign um, that I was able to be successful um, for the fifth district. Um, in 2016, we were elected all elected that same yeah. year. So that, that's what I did. Sorry, Judge. Yeah, no, no, that's perfect. <laughs> that's, that's good. Uh, County exec. Yeah, so you talk about running a gamut as far as employment. Wow. I, I mean, when I first graduated high school, I probably had one of the hardest jobs. And I was working for an organization uh, called Project Return Through Public Allies. And my job was to help ex-offenders find employment and housing as they were returning uh, back home into society. 
Uh, but from there on, I started doing a lot of community organizing. I organized as a, as a teen leader for a Children's Outing Association at the Golden Center on 23rd and Burleigh. I then left there and worked for the YMCA on 13th and North Avenue uh, as one of their organizers. I went to Safe and Sound uh, and worked as a community partner. And then I got my first political start in, in 2010 uh, working for then United States Senator Russ Feingold as, his, uh, as a statewide African American organizer. And I would tell you, I had no clue what I was getting myself into during political <laughs> organizing. Um, but I quickly learned that not only I, I liked what I was doing, but I was pretty good at it. And when that campaign ended, uh, a county board supervisor at the time, Nakia Harris, not Nakia Dodd, uh, literally called me up and said, I want you to come work for me. I've never worked in government, never did policy work before, but worked for a year and a half for the Milwaukee County Board as a legislative aide. And she then became a state senator. That's right. And she said, you're coming with me. She didn't even give me a choice. She just said, you're coming with me. And so I, I worked uh, within the, the state senate as a, as a legislative aide for four years before deciding to run for office in 2016 and then became a, a state representative before having this seat. All right. I remember all those days. <laughs> I remember the safe and sound. I remember oh, yeah. I, I, was, I was the board president of the Northside Y. I remember oh, all I've seen you a I'm lot. I'm so proud of all of you. But, <laughs> so let's, we got a little background of you. I just wanted everybody to know who you were, where you came from, what brought you to where you are right now, because I think a lot of that has to do with how you all actually lead. And so um, I'm going to start talking about a couple issues that are affecting Milwaukee right now. And so the first one I want to talk about has to do with our population. So Milwaukee itself, I don't know if everybody's aware, um, has lost its population consistently since 1960. It's gone down. We're now at 577,000 people who live in the city of Milwaukee, and that's the lowest it's ever been since 1930. And I know that, um, uh, Mayor Johnson, this is something that's near and dear to your heart, and they actually worked with uh, a couple of our senior fellow, Mike Goucher, as well as our um, policy fellow, John Johnson, in regards to what can be done to increase our population. So tell us how you are attacking this problem on the decrease of Milwaukee's population. Well, thank you. I think that's a, an excellent question and one I'm happy to, to talk about. It is something that's very important to me because I've noticed those same trends. I know you said 577. We're actually contesting that. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, and we're contesting it for a number of reasons because uh, in cities across the country, Milwaukee is no exception, uh, in the last census, uh, there were, it was rampant with, with errors. It was rushed. The deadline for uh, getting those totals reported was uh, truncated. Um, and so there were a number of reasons why we asked for, um, for uh, a, a, a reconsideration on that with the U.S. Census Bureau. And not to mention that uh, in cities like ours where there's large numbers of people of color, there's severe undercounting of those populations. And so we are working to uh, make sure there's an accurate count uh, in Milwaukee. So uh, we've been hovering around 600,000 people, but uh, not a steady gain. I think after reading some of the uh, uh, work that's been done by John and by Mike and the Journal Sentinel, there's a, a term, a stable decline. Um, and that's the position that Milwaukee has been over the course of the last number of years. Um, I mentioned before that you know, uh, I went to six different elementary schools, and so I, I've been to schools on the far north side, northwest side of Milwaukee, all the way to the south side of Milwaukee uh, through my educational journey in Milwaukee public schools. And one of the things that I recall uh, being on the school bus is seeing the, the, the green signs, city Milwaukee, population, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. I remember when I was a kid, it was 628,000. Mm -hmm. Then later on, it was 596,000, then 594,000, then, you know, uh, some of the uh, issues we've been dealing with uh, as of late. And to me, like, if you're a city, cities are, about, cities are about growth. They're about attracting people, right? You're supposed to experience cities. They're supposed to be vibrant, uh, vibrancy in cities. And that's what I want to grow. I don't want Milwaukee to simply be a city that's in some other city's shadow. I know you're from Chicago. Yeah, no. My dad's from Chicago. <laughs> no offense taken, no offense taken. I, my, my wife's from Chicago, my dad's from Chicago. Like, I love Chicago, but no offense, like, I don't want to be Chicago's little sister. That's right. Like, I want Milwaukee to be a city of itself, on its own, standing on its own feet. And so I think, you know, being in a position to grow our population and beat our chest a little bit and stop being so modest about who we are, because we've got some great institutions, we've got some great people, we've got a, a tremendous opportunity to grow this place. And that's what I want to see. Either you're growing or you're shrinking. Either you're winning or you're losing. Uh, either you're alive or you're dying or dead. And I don't want to be the latter. Uh, all right, so, so that's what we're doing. Um, and again, uh, to point to the work that John uh, and, and Mike talked about in terms of how do you grow 
uh, a city like Milwaukee, uh, uh, we're actually implementing a number of those things uh, as it stands right now. So one of the first things I think uh, is important is making sure we have access to family supporting careers. Mm -hmm. If you look back in Milwaukee five decades ago, we used to have access to uh, a number of heavy manufacturing jobs that drew people from uh, the South specifically to Milwaukee. And these are African Americans and people of color. Um, when those jobs dried up and went overseas to right to work states or went down south um, uh, and the like, um, what happened was it put us in a position where those neighborhoods got sucked into this cycle of poverty and then that poverty then leads to violence and then you see people evacuating from those neighborhoods. Well, my goal is to make sure that we bring new jobs into Milwaukee, family supporting jobs. And you look at the work that you know, I've done, been a part of since I've been a, a principal leader in government, not just mayor, but also in my time serving as council president, um, the couture is rising out of the ground. Now that's a fancy luxury apartment for folks, but the people who build those jobs, build uh, that facility, uh, they're coming from neighborhoods where we lived growing up, right? That's providing access to a family supporting career in the union construction industry. Uh, you look at Milwaukee Tool, that's growing jobs. They're growing like gangbusters and these jobs are going to exist my thought was that if they're going to exist, they shouldn't exist just in our suburbs, in our general area. They should be in the city of Milwaukee, right? Family supporting jobs in the city. And so we have those jobs coming here. My administration has pushed really hard to land the expansion of Northwestern Mutual. Thousands of jobs coming to Milwaukee. My administration has pushed to advance Pfizer, the namesake of Pfizer Forum. Instead of sending their world headquarters to Georgia, where they've got a large office presence, to Omaha, where they've got a large office presence, or out east, where they're President CEO sits, their global headquarters is here in the city of Milwaukee. So we'll do more things like that to attract family supporting jobs to Milwaukee. Other things, like we announced just yesterday, improving the, the physical built infrastructure in Milwaukee, right? We, we were highlighting this uh, uh, infrastructure project on West Walnut, right? We're uh, doing road diets, making the streets safer, putting in protected bike lanes, this built infrastructure that's attractive to other folks who may move to Milwaukee from other places. And I know that President Perez uh, you know, sees this as important, I do too. Um, and, and that's making Milwaukee a welcoming place for immigrants, right? Uh, immigrants are the lifeblood of our country and Milwaukee should be an opening place for them. We've already historically been the Ellis Island of Wisconsin. We should continue to do that. Mm -hmm. And I know that, again, President Perez uh, has worked with folks out in the community uh, to have a welcoming center for new arrivals uh, to Milwaukee. Uh, I believe in that, uh, I support that. And uh, outside of that, um, there are a number of other things that we're doing to advance uh, our desire to grow the population uh, here in Milwaukee. Thank you. President Perez, you want to elaborate on the Welcome Center? Oh, sure. Um, we work closely with several <clears throat> partners, including Voces La Frontera and myself, Alderwoman uh, Samaripa and Alderwoman Dimitrievich, uh, really led the charge to make sure that uh, the new building that they purchased, we could provide services, and especially on Mitchell Street, which um, I call the United Nations Corridor, because <laughs> um, you, know, you can go west and there's a Somali grocer. You can go east and find an East Indian, not only a guy who does taxes, but next to his tax place, he sells groceries <laughs> and animals there and several Latino businesses. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we had an immigrant a center that was not only welcoming to everyone, but then would provide a one-stop shop to say, you want some help and direction with our municipal IDs that we have for folks that you don't need, um, you, you don't need to be documented to have an ID that every department in the city, including the police, will accept as your identification. Uh, so we wanted it to be a one-stop shop. Do you want a food dealer license? Do you want to know how to, uh, where to go to get your driver's license? And that's what we want to do out of the uh, Immigrant Welcoming Center. And then just on the population, um, uh, I represent probably one of the fastest growing districts where we have a lot of development. Yeah. And it wasn't until recently that we actually there was, we raised a residential unit for the old La Fuente site. That was the first time a building was raised, residential unit was, building was raised for development in the 10 years I've been there. Oh. So we, we want to be very smart about our growth and we want to increase it into neighborhoods, right? We talk a lot about downtown. We want to make sure neighborhoods are feeling that um, they're worth investing in. Mm -hmm. Every opportunity we can, we could do some housing. We have... Uh, I mean, our Latino community is one of the densest places in the city. Uh, we're growing so much into the district south and west that we almost carved the third majority <laughs> aldermanic <laughs> district. We came really close. We tried really hard, didn't, didn't do it. But um, the Latino growth has been 
has been tremendous in this community. We want to continue to support that. And I always tell people, you want to see what Milwaukee looks like, come to the south side. Uh, our African-American population, Arab population, you name it. We have everyone uh, on the south side working. And we, in that growth, uh, we got to make sure we take care of our neighborhoods, which is something that the council wants to see happen, because every council member thinks that their district's at the very top for <laughs> development. And we want to help, and we want to do that. We, we want to be smart about it. We don't want to displace anyone. And uh, you know, we, we really want to continue to support our anti-displacement uh, fund and make sure that people in the neighborhoods don't feel like they're being priced out. Another issue, I'm going to bring this to my, my county, uh, Madam Chairwoman, as well as county executive. Homelessness has been a problem uh, in Milwaukee for some time, but we've made major strides. Yes. I mean, I, I saw recently that uh, per capita, Milwaukee has the lowest homeless population of any city Correct. in the United States. But that didn't just happen overnight. And I know that both uh, you and Madam Chairwoman had a lot to put into that. And I think it comes from where you, how you grew up, right? Oh, absolutely. And so could you tell us about the um, initiative which lowered Milwaukee's homeless population? I, oh, absolutely. I mean, a lot of this, you know, I have to give the, the Madam Chairwoman credit because a lot of this started even before I got here when they started focusing on the Housing First program. And this is a nationally recognized program that we have within Milwaukee County. And as you stated, we have the lowest sheltered, un, uh, lowest unsheltered homeless population in the country per capita. And just for the record, that's two years in a row. <laughs> <laughs> that's two years in a row. And one of the things is, is that one, we believe that you have to provide housing first, right? Before you can wrap around all the other services that people need. And so for us, it's not just about, okay, how do we make sure that we get people housing? But we also had to look internally about how do we break down the silos and the barriers that we even have created within Milwaukee County itself. And so we also believe that we have to have a no wrong door policy. So no matter what avenue you are coming through Milwaukee County, no matter what door you are utilizing, we want to make sure that we're wrapping around all the programs and services that you absolutely need to help you thrive, to give you that stepping stone that you need. Uh, but it's near and dear to me because, you know, I've, I've, I was evicted three times by the time I was a sophomore in high school. Okay, and from, from the ages of about uh, 15 to about 26, I moved every year of my life. The only stability I literally had was going to MPS schools. You know, Our Avenue, Meg Middle School, Bayview High School. So the only schools that I went to where all my stability came from. And so now we have, we've been able to take advantage of an opportunity with the help of the county board chair, uh, chairwoman and the county board, as well as our ARPA task force, where we've set aside a lot of our ARPA dollars to actually invest in affordable housing. We just recently announced an affordable housing project happening in South Milwaukee. We have it happening in West Dallas. We have it happening in Brown Deer. We have another project coming online soon. But this is the most affordable housing that we have seen being driven by a county uh, since probably the 1930s. And so this is, this is extremely something to be proud of, but we know that we still have a long road ahead of us because we know that there's still an affordable housing crisis out there. Can I, can I just provide an on-the-ground perspective to that? I, we get a lot of complaints, and when we call housing first, um, there's a lot of residents and citizens who are complaining who think no one is doing anything. No, I mean, their homeless outreach team has to go back several times sometimes. I had a gentleman across the street from my house at Pulaski Park, slept in the park, mental health issues. It took several visits, connection, not giving up on that person, and people think that no one is doing anything, and that team yes. is consistently out there talking to people and following up until they're in a safe place. And I, I've seen it firsthand. I've been out with the team and I've seen what they've done, sleeping under some of the highway underpasses that we have that so. become nuisance, there are lots of businesses nearby. But everyone needs to know, people on the street are being talked to, are being approached, are being given resources. And not everyone believes that or thinks that, but I can tell you that's happening. And it's a very important piece to the out, that homeless outreach team is awesome. So I just want to give props. Madam Chairwoman, you were actually part of that initiative before the county executive. Yeah, you know. and I, I and I was, um, but I'm so grateful for County Executive Crowley for being such a great steward, you know, of that work and carrying it forward. Um, how I got involved was also because it's personal to me. I, I grew up housing insecure. 
When I taught Pierce Elementary School, we were a 25% homeless population. Many of these children were leaving the classroom and didn't have a bed to sleep in. Um, and so it was important to me when I, be, when I got on the board to work with our former county executive to you know, approach this problem. I served on the continuum of care board um, that included members from the city, um, business, and so on, to put our heads together and figure out how can we long-term um, impact this issue. Um, I would say our board, the Board of Supervisors, there's 18 of us representing 19 municipalities throughout the county. Um, they are also very good stewards um, of this work and see it as a, a critical a mission to making you know, Milwaukee a, a safe place um, to live, work, and play. Um, and I, you know, thank you, but it's not just me, right? It's all of those, those folks and those players I just named. Um, and I'll just end with an anecdote. Um, I, uh, I, I should have jumped in on a Milwaukee question since you jumped in on ours. <laughs> <laughs> My bad, please. It's okay, because what I was going to say is, you know, if I hear somebody say, oh, Milwaukee is bad, or I don't like it, or it's trash, I'm ready to fight them, because I think <laughs> Milwaukee is outstanding. Thank we you. have some of the best food, we have the best people, we have some of the best culture, you know, and so on. And um, I like to bring a lot of people in. In my side work, I get to travel the, co the country quite frequently. And I'm a part of some um, or, um, national boards and organizations. And I actually encourage them to come in and do their conferences here, hold your meetings here. They've been in the museum. They've been in the zoo. And um, most recently, I had someone visiting from Brooklyn, New York. And I was kind of driving him around. And he goes, OK, um, so where are the homeless people? Where, where are the homeless people? Where are you hiding them at? And I said, well, actually, I'm so proud to share with you <laughs> that we've been doing X, Y, Z. And you know, we have one of the lowest you know, chronically homeless populations in the country. And he was just so impressed. Um, and I think that's a testament to all of our work together. You know, and, I, and I think it's, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have partners. What folks may not understand is that when you think about our, our homeless outreach team that services downtown alone, 100% of, uh, of those proceeds that pay for that team comes from downtown businesses. So we have worked with businesses, we're working with nonprofits, we're working with for-profits in the philanthropic community to figure out how we all have, have to take ownership of the problem and the solution as we move forward. Absolutely. I have a follow-up on my question yeah. to you, because I know you're in a un unique situation, yeah. because sometimes you find yourself in rooms where not only are you the youngest person in the room, but you're often the only female in the room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so tell us how you navigated that to get to the chairwoman position. Wow, how I navigate it. it it's like, it's still, a, you know, it's a, you take it day by day. Um, you know, Judge Mosley, I'll say this. I, I had the luxury growing up of, um, you know, being exposed to a lot of different things through, you know, my dad's maybe friendships or dealings and so on. And so I never was shy around different types of people. Um, but I, I will say when I, when I did become a county supervisor and then ultimately chairwoman, I experienced, I think, the worst of the microaggressions, the, you know, invisible, you know, I'm invisible to some people. There are times, you know, I've met folks four or five times and they still don't know who I am when I see them again. And, you know, I know our, these, they're amazing, but, you know, you know, they just don't have to deal with those sorts of things. Because it's not that I'm young, it's not well, that I'm, I'm just- I'm always Mayor Johnson. Well, that's true, that's true, that's true. That's true. Wait, which is the cuter one? Because every time we want to- That's stuff. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's not just young, it's not just women, it's sometimes being the only black person in the room. So um, of 72 counties, I'm the only black person that chairs a county. Um, and, and part of Wisconsin Counties Association, I sit on the board of directors. And um, I put up a resolution for us to adopt in our platform to eradicate, eradicate poverty um, and systemic racism. And that actually was a debate. Um, they would not vote on it. Um, I had to sit there and argue you know, why we needed this. Um, and for me, it was, okay, we have some work to do. Um, instead of just, you know, getting upset about it, you know, um, you know, moving on from it, I actually worked with the Counties Association to do a statewide tour where we went from Hayward to Pewaukee, every uh, region of the state, um, representatives from 72 counties, and we talked about DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, what, how it works in Milwaukee, how it may work in a rural county and up, you know, um, up w Wisconsin. Um, and through that, we learned that we have much more in common than we have, you know, different. 
And um, every day, almost once a week, I get some sort of email like, Chairwoman, thank you. Um, we want to invite you to this. Come do this. And it, it really shows me that there's power in just relationship building and connecting with others and not really having a victim mentality, but rather finding those, those points of, of, of consensus um, that you can find with different people so that they have no choice but to respect you, um, <laughs> you know, and care about the work that you're doing. You, you brought up an interesting point, and the point being that you were willing to go to places to try to, to Absol- show. Well, they won't come here. Right. So, <laughs> you know, you so, know it, it but, is but, an but, issue. But that's, that's right. important. Exactly. And so that brings me back to all the things that we've been talking about, the things from increasing the population to homelessness and uh, the, the migrant center that, um, that Alderman Perez, President Perez talked about. All of this costs money. Oh, yeah. Right? And so um, one of the issues that's going on in the city, and I bring up the fact traveling and talking to people, is that um, the city of Milwaukee has been receiving the same revenue sharing from the state for since I was in law school, to put it into perspective. Um, and so what I liked about uh, the city and the county working together, what I like about all of you up here is that you are willing to make those trips to have those hard conversations. And so. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, could you give us, any, any one of you can, give us a little synopsis of the shared revenue situation? And- oh, absolutely. And, and you know this is our topic. <laughs> um, so for those who may not understand, when it comes down to municipal governments, you know, we have a lot of restrictions. So we can't, uh, you know, we have levy minutes that have been uh, imposed by the state level. Uh, as a county, we are an extension of the state, so we have state-mandated programs. And so on an annual basis, we are seeing all of our costs increasing at about 2.4%, yet we can't raise revenues over 1%. I want you to understand that. We can't raise revenues over 1%, but our costs are growing at 2.4%. And this is not even including what we have to do in order to make sure that we're fully funding our pension on an everyday basis. And so what we did, uh, we, we made sure to take this, this, ro- this show on the road. And so I remember when he was president of the, of the Common Council at the time, Mayor Johnson and I, we went up to Rhinelander. And people was like, why are you in Rhinelander? I'm like, you don't want to see the Hodak? But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it gave us an opportunity to go to a place that people don't expect to see anybody from Milwaukee no. to be. And we were able to actually have conversations, talk about the situation in Milwaukee to where other communities in northern Wisconsin said, I'm having the exact same problem. And I think that's how we've gotten to this place. And we've been to Warsaw, we've been to Madison, we've been to Chippewa Falls. It's nice to tap the golden keg. But, <laughs> but people don't, some people don't understand that if you drop a dime on Milwaukee, it creates a ripple effect across the state of Wisconsin. And so, you know, when you think about the fact that we have wars and cores in our backyard, if we want to make the investments in, in retaining and recruiting our employees, we have to be able to have revenues to do that. But if a company like Morrison Coors leaves, how does that affect Lion and Cougar, which is in the backyard of Chippewa Falls, right? How, how does all of these companies who rely on the workforce in the, in the economy of our entire region, how are they going to, how are this going to basically, what is going to affect them if we're not able to do what we need to do? And, and as the mayor said, you know, we, we are part of the economic engine of the state. When you think about a quarter of the the, the, the visit, visitors that come into Wisconsin, a quarter of the revenues from, uh, for, uh, what am I thinking? Tourism. Of? Tourism, thank you. A uh, <laughs> quarter of those revenues come from Milwaukee County, right? And so if we want to make sure that people are coming here and we can capture those dollars so we can keep, take care of the folks that we need to take care of in our own community while as well supporting the rest of the state, we have to be in the best position possible. Yeah. If you think about it like this, okay, if you go back to the year 2000, Right. If you use that as your demarcation line, you, you would see how we got into this situation that many of you read about in the newspaper today in terms of the, the financial problems that face the city of Milwaukee, Milwaukee County uh, most prominently, but not just the city and the county of Milwaukee, Everybody. other communities across the entire state of Wisconsin. This is not a city of Milwaukee and Milwaukee County issue alone. It's a statewide issue. We just happen to be the ones that uh, are largely affected by it, who've been affected by it the most, and are leading the charge to uh, make the change here so that every community in the state is able to be lifted up. But if you look back at the year 2000, these are some very important points. We used to get enough money in the state shared revenue program, 
And what's shared revenue? When you go out and you purchase something you know, in our community, there's a sales tax that's associated with that. Um, that money does not come to the city of Milwaukee. The Milwaukee County is able to get a very small, small, minuscule part of that. The lion's share of that goes to the state of Wisconsin. The state of Wisconsin is supposed to divvy that money up and then send it back to local communities to take care of our needs on the ground. Well, over the past 20, 30 years, the state has been keeping more and more and more of those dollars, even though our costs at the local level, as the county executive pointed out, have continued to rise. So if you look back again at the year 2000, in the city of Milwaukee, we received enough money in that one pot, shared revenue, to cover the entirety of our police department budget, right? The police department is our largest budget expenditure in the city of Milwaukee. We used to get enough in that one pot to take care of that and to take care of the entirety of the fire department budget and have tens of millions of dollars to invest in infrastructure, uh, other local priorities. Today I'd be working to direct that money to fill in potholes and address, addressing reckless driving and pulling lead service laterals out of the ground. Now we don't even get enough money in shared revenue to cover the police department budget. Right? So, so therein lies the problem. We talk about this all the time, and, and, and some of the conversations that we have are really tough, really difficult. Uh, myself and the county executive, certainly, I mean, we're in Madison every week, uh, every other week, one of the two of us, we bump into each other in the halls. I thought uh, I was leaving. Co <laughs> <laughs> Constantly. You um, yeah, you, you, you thought. <laughs> um, but this, it, it's, it's such an important issue that we are spending the time and efforts to go there. I mean, and the, and the, the thing that I think is is uh, that, that should be pointed out here is the fact that even though we haven't as a community been able to come to a resolution on this in the past 20 or so years, we are closer than we ever have been before. And that's because of the dedicated work of the city of Milwaukee, Milwaukee County, our partners in the business community and others working alongside with the leadership and the legislature and the governor to elevate this issue that, ben that benefits the city of Milwaukee, Milwaukee County, and again, all other communities across the entire state of Wisconsin. And I'll just add, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't you know, add how challenging this issue is from the legislative perspective. Um, President Perez and I penned an op-ed in the journal Sitno. I encourage you all to go and find that because it really lays out you know, what our structural issues are um, and how from the legislative perspective and adopting a budget annually um, is so challenging. Prior to County Executive Crowley and prior to the pandemic, which you know, brought its own set of problems, um, the county board was adopting a budget with a $25 million, well, I'm sorry, we were uh, debating a budget with a $25 million, um, million um, dollar gap to start, to begin with. And so we're having to raise vehicle fees, we are, we're having to raise property taxes, and our constituents are telling us no more, no more. Well, we run out of options, uh, which is why the fair deal now uh, for MKE was created um, to help uh, you know, advocate for this 1% sales tax. Um, now that we have uh, COVID, we got ARPA funding, we got CARES funding, and that allowed us to you know, fill some operational gaps, to fund some like one-time programs and so on and so on. But we know that when that funding runs out, we're right back to that same place unless we have this key, um, uh, th this key uh, funding source. Um, what David had mentioned is we have state mandated services, but we also have non-state mandated services that are probably the most cared about. Our public transportation system, the state does not fund that for us. Our park system, the state does not fund that for us. Like arts and culture and so on. So we're trying to get them to understand how important Milwaukee is, not only to the state, but the region um, at large. And you know, I agree, I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not in Madison once a week, but <laughs> I've met with you know, key players definitely and I'm there often enough um, that they know me by name um, and it's just been great to sit at the table with you know all of these gentlemen and you know everyone on the steering committee um, and those in the greater Milwaukee area who are interested in finding a solution and knowing that it's not it's not your representatives that don't want to do this work for you it's that uh, we need to focus on that that synergy put our eyes on the prize and work together to get it done one of the last issues I want to talk about uh, is a lot of people probably aren't aware of this, so, and if I'm incorrect, please let me know, but 15% of crime has dropped, right? Crime has dropped by 15%, so robberies, burglaries, thefts have dropped by 15%. Homicides have ticked up a little bit. Um, so in regards to the public safety and 
uh, guns and homicides. What is the city and the county doing to uh, attack this problem? Well, I'm glad that you brought that up, uh, Judge, Director, Derek, <laughs> um, because, because I think that's important to note. Uh, oftentimes, you'll, you'll, you'll pick up a newspaper or you'll watch the news at night and you'll see these glaring headlines about you know, violence that's taken place. And not that those things should not be reported, they should, you know, that's, that's important. But it's also important uh, to make sure that we know about the positive things that are happening in Milwaukee too. And so I you know, take the time to point out the fact that in the one solid year, 2022, that I've been mayor, uh, working with uh, the, our police chief, working with uh, the city council, President Perez is here, I see Alderman Marina Dimitrievich uh, and back as well, uh, working with our partners in the county and the business community, the, the violence prevention, the whole gamut, we've been able to push crime down in Milwaukee 15% overall in 2022, and violent crime in Milwaukee is down 7% in 2022, and our trends continue to go in a positive direction uh, here in 2023 in crime uh, overall. That's important to note. That, that, that is extremely important to note because I think, you know, oftentimes, again, people see the news and they just get, they, they get scared or they think that, you know, that's, you know, the, the farm is sold, like we're just going down that path, and, and that's not the case. We're fighting to make this a safer community each and every single day. Um, but one of the biggest partners that we have outside of all the folks uh, and organizations that I just mentioned is you. It's you guys out there. Um, I talk about this frequently and that uh, I need not just law enforcement to be at, at the table or elected officials to be at the table. I need teachers, I need preachers, I need mentors, I need friends, I need parents to step up and be a part of the solution. When somebody goes out and pulls a trigger, on a Saturday night, they go sit on somebody's couch. Yeah. Somebody knows what's going on, right? And they may not listen to me, they not hear me, they may not hear the police chief or anybody uh, sitting up here right now, but they hear you and you know them. And so we need your help to make sure that we curb violence uh, in our community. So we're doing a, a whole multitude of things uh, to, 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 to curb violence and, and to push that down. Some of which we've discussed in terms of uh, uh, the, the jobs that we're bringing into Milwaukee, uh, the, the programming that we have in Milwaukee, such as our Earn and Learn Summer Youth Jobs Program that's taking the applications right now, our Camp Rise program that we started last year to create a, an alternative path for kids as young as 10 years old who otherwise may be susceptible to stealing cars uh, and participating in that uh, way of life. Uh, uh, our efforts around housing, we use some of our uh, American Rescue Plan Act dollars to make the city's most significant impact in affordable housing ever. Millions of dollars to basically hit two birds with one stone, uh, and that's repair city-owned tax foreclosed properties and then sell them at affordable rates uh, for Milwaukee, and so we're gonna stabilize neighborhoods uh, to stay in those properties. So all of these things help to affect public safety and their root cause issues. Because my belief is that if you address issues at their root, then you can create an environment that is teeming with safety for folks, and that safety will then yield uh, uh, opportunities for business to grow. Those businesses growing creates opportunities for people to work in uh, with family support and wages. Those family support and wages help to expand the opportunity for folks to have stability in their lives. If they have stability, then stability comes to the kids. And then the kids' reactions when they leave out the house uh, and go into the streets or the schools is different because they come from stable family environments. So uh, we are drilling down on root level issues in the city of Milwaukee to address crime. Absolutely. And, you know, I would say that we're, we're doing the exact same thing. You, you, one, you cannot think about what we're going to do in the future if you do not take a look in the mirror and think about what has happened in the past. Yeah. And we all know that this, a lot of this boils down to the social determinants of health, focusing on those root causes, whether we're talking about housing, whether we're talking about education, access to health care, transportation. <laughs> Milwaukee County, we have a hand in all of those different types of things. And so, uh, we recently allocated about $6.7 million to look at what crime reduction strategies can we actually uh, employ and really work with the city of Milwaukee on. So one of the first things that we've done is we've expanded our Credible Messengers program. And our Credible Messengers program works with young people who've been through the, who's been justice involved. And 77% of those young people who have been through that program in the past five years have not come back through our doors, right? But the problem is that we don't get the opportunity to expand that program even more because of the state mandates, because it's now costing us about $450,000 a year to keep a, keep a locked person locked up 
within Lincoln Hills. Uh, but we're also looking at what, what can we look at when it, as it requires uh, design changes in like our parkland where we know it has the, uh, the ability to increase the propensity of violence as well in our communities. But we would tell you that at Milwaukee County, we would say that yes, do we need to fund law enforcement? Absolutely. But you have to fund the public safety continuum. Mm -hmm. Because once a, what can we do, one, before a person even has to have law enforcement contact? How does that deal with employment? How does that deal with uh, maybe mental health? Uh, how does that uh, also deal with uh, transportation? Uh, but we also believe that when you, when you talk about investing upstream, that Again, you, we have to put our money where our mouth is and really put the money into the programs. And so when it comes down to, to the public safety continuum, people forget that mentoring is a part of this, uh -huh. that job placement is a part of this, that supporting our court system is a part of this. Because if they can't get, get through the system, then we create even backlogs. And so we won't have places for people to go. And I will tell you that now, you know, the fact that we have the Community Reintegration Center, formerly known as the House of Correction, we want to be able to make the investments in our residents to make sure that when they come back into society, we have given them the tools and the skills needed to become a thriving citizen in our, in, in, in our community. So when we, we, we have to make sure that we're funding the entire gamut of the public safety continuum, and a lot of that requires us to invest upstream. I'm, I'm looking around. You want to go? Yeah, yes. I want to go. Because I, I think we, we have a lot of work to do. I look at uh, District 2 that I represent with all the women in Zamaripa, and homicide's up 80%. And um, we have a gap between the services that are actually happening and having an effect with people in our neighborhoods. Uh, I was on Spanish radio on Saturday, and no one could understand why we have uh, prostitution out in the open, drive by Lincoln, drive by Greenfield, drive by Parson National wondering how can people do this out in the open. I tried to explain we can't ticket our way out of it. We don't have enough resources. Um, Benedict Center, uh, Inner Beauty are all doing great work in our neighborhoods. It's not enough. There's, we, I can't explain how, I can't tell them this is how they can do it or can't do it. I mean, it's out in everyone's, out in the open in people's faces. And so we have a difficult time between some of the resources and the people getting connected to them. And um, we, we have to do better at home when I think about, I mean, my wife has been a stay-at-home mom since my daughter's been born. She spends countless hours looking all over the place for opportunities for my kids to do stuff. And out of the 100 things she'll find, maybe they'll do three or four of them, right? <laughs> um, and I think to myself, we're often hearing at midnight, 1 o'clock, we have 14, 13-year-olds in cars driving around, and we think to ourselves, Everyone's asking the same question. They're just not saying it out loud, like, what's going on at home? Mm -hmm. Who's following up at home? Mm -hmm. How do we get people engaged? And it's, it's a big gap between what's going on in, in people's homes and on the street and what's happening in our neighborhoods and the services provided. So we, we got to close that gap somehow. There's not enough connection between some of the services and some of the offenders we have in our neighborhood. And I, I'll tell you, um, people wonder how folks aren't being held accountable, and we're all struggling with different parts of the system not working at times. The police are arresting people, they're charging folks. No one, no one can answer us on how that continues forward through the court system or how people are held accountable, whatever the case may be. And we all gotta do more digging and talking to one another at home. I recently had a tragedy in my family, and um, we had to take a real hard look and figure out after it, we started looking into the person's background, figuring out there was a history of domestic violence, and we all felt horrible that we didn't do more on the front end. It was, it was painful. And so I'm asking everyone that let's do more on the front end, especially at home. Um, and I'll, I'll just add, you know, uh, Milwaukee is such an incredible city, um, and we are plagued by this particular issue. Um, and it, it's something that I'm really passionate about solving. And I think the executives, the, both the mayor and the county executive, have been doing amazing, incredible, like broad sweeping changes, um, visioning for impacting this issue. But I feel like there are also smaller things that like we've been doing in my office, and I think all of you in the audience can also do to help improve you know, public safety. When, I think about, when we think about public safety, we always think about the police, right? Like we gotta, we gotta fund the police, we need more police on the streets. 
the reality is police don't prevent crime. Communities do. And I grew up in a neighborhood where it was challenged, but if we ever had to walk to my grandmother's house from 12th and Burla to 23rd and Keith, there are three neighbors that call her on the way there. She knew we were safe and on the way. And unfortunately, we live in a reality where we aren't, you know, we don't know our neighbors anymore. Um, we're not a village. We don't have that village mentality. And so to the mayor's point, when crime happens, we're less likely to, you know, stand up and confront that individual or to pr protect the community because we're not invested in or don't feel that, you know, that community belongs to us. So activating our parks, I think, is, is one incredible way to solve our crime issue. Um, Sherman Park this past summer, we had our first annual Harvest Fest that brought hundreds of people to that Sherman Park neighborhood. And a, 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 a park that is engaged in, a park that is active, a park where people are playing is a safer park. Yes. Um, and we can do that throughout the city. And, and to Jose Perez's, or President Perez's point, um, we have so many services out there, not only at the county, not only at the city, but there, some of you are probably nonprofit owners and you do this work. You're our best ambassadors for this. Please get out the word. Share these services with folks. Um, let us know how we can get out the word to you and your organization so we can have a more hands on, all hands on deck approach because not one person can solve this issue. We are up against time now. I, I promise we'll start on time and try to end on time. <laughs> so I want to thank County Executive David Crowley, Chairwoman Marcelia Nicholson, uh, Mayor Cavalier Johnson, and Common Council President Jose Perez. So I want to give a round of applause.